الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيدي ولدي آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا يحسبن الذين كفروا سبقوا إنهم لا يعجزون وأعد لهم ما استطعتم من قوة ومن رباط الخيل ترهبون به عدو, عدو الله وعدوكم وآخرين من دونهم لا تعلمونهم الله يعلمهم وما تنفقوا من شيء في سبيل الله يوفى إليكم وأنتم لا تظلمون رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Today's khutbah is dedicated to one maybe two ayat of Surah Al-Anfal and as I explain what I can share with you from these ayat, it will become clear why I have chosen them. In ayah number 59, Allah describes, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا To give you some context before I translate, pretty much all of Surah Al-Anfal is commentary from Allah for the Muslims to prepare themselves not before the battle of Badr, but after the battle of Badr. So there's one thing to prepare the army before they go into battle. It's another thing to prepare them after they won the battle. But you would think if they won the battle, why did they need preparation? It's interesting that before Badr, Allah revealed several ayat about qital and preparing for that battle. And that was done in Surah Al-Baqarah among other places. But what Allah says, about what to do afterwards is far more detailed. Surah Al-Anfal is exhaustive. It's massive. It is as if Allah Azza wa Jal wanted the Muslims to understand something. That you need more mental preparation after you win. Not before you win. Because after you win, even if you have a small victory, there's a chance you might get complacent. You, there's a chance you might lose your, the, the same energy and that motivation because you feel like you can't be defeated. You feel invincible temporarily. So there's a preparation being made of the Muslims after the battle of, of Badr. And of course we know a much tougher challenge was ahead of us, Uhud. Hindsight is twenty twenty. The Muslims who were reading these ayat, the Sahaba that were listening to these ayat for the first time, they didn't know that Uhud is around the corner. 
They didn't know what was going to happen in Ahzab. They didn't know what else was coming. But Allah Azza wa Jal knew and Allah was preparing them in advance. Now, part of that preparation is also motivation about what is coming. Because you might even think, we won this one time, we got this little small victory, but probably things are going to get a lot worse afterwards. You have an anxiety that the enemy will strike back and strike back much harder, and they're not going to have any, any limits in how they behave. Allah Azza wa even describes in other places in the Qur'an that the enemies of the Muslims, they're not like us. We're not allowed to attack non-combatants. We're not even allowed to burn down trees. But they will not care, you know. And Allah says, يَبْسُطُوا إِلَيْكُمْ أَيْدِيَهُمْ وَأَلْسِنَتَهُمْ بِالسُّوءُ That they're going to extend their hands to you. بَسْطُ الْأَيْدِي is majazi phrase. It's an expression in Arabic to say, they will attack you any way they can, any way they want, indiscriminate, doesn't matter what the collateral damage is, doesn't matter if children die, doesn't matter if women die, doesn't matter if houses and trees and animals get burnt down, they don't care. They are going to attack in that way. You know, and they will extend their hands to you indiscriminately. That's how they will do so. And some, some Muslims even in, in Surah Al-Mumtahana, which I'll be talking about this week at, uh, you know, during a tafsir program, some Muslims thought that maybe because we have family with people back in Mecca, because the Sahaba who moved, the Muhajirun, they have family back in Mecca still, right? So maybe because they're family, that they, they won't hate us as much. And Allah says, لَن تَنْفَعَكُمْ أَرْحَمُكُمْ وَلَا أُولَادُكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَفْصِلُ بَيْنَكُمْ He says, these family ties, they're not going to care about them. إِنْ يَثْقَفُوكُمْ يَكُونُ لَكُمْ أَعْدَى If they catch you, they're going to be their en your enemies to you. You think you should be kinder to them, they don't think that way. In other words, you have one kind of mentality, but your enemy has a very different kind of mentality. There is no code. There are no rules that are binding them to a, to a principle of humanity. There's no fear they have of Allah. They see the enemy and they don't care if when they define you as an enemy, it doesn't matter if you have a weapon in your hand or not. You're an enemy and you must die. It is not the way for the believer. The believers had so much discipline even on the battlefield that if they're fighting someone in the middle of the battlefield and the, the sword drops and he says, he says the kalima, they're supposed to stop. They're supposed in the middle of a fight, they're supposed to stop. And so with this in mind, I wanted to share these two ayat of Surah Al-Anfal with you. Allah says, لا يحسبن الذين كفروا سبقوا Don't ever imagine that those who've disbelieved got an advantage, that they got ahead. سبقوا <coughs> Another way to translate سبقوا can also be, don't think they got away with it. You know, you might think when you look at the scenario in the world, that those who engage in acts of oppression, those who are the Fir'aun of today, they get away with it. Nobody can stop them. We can give speeches, we can raise our voices, we can make posts, we can make videos, we can expose what they do, we can show video footage, we can show articles, research, journalistic papers, even their own people. We can gather all the evidence and cry and scream and they're still doing what they're doing. They got away with it. There's, there's no sanctions, there's no, there's no action. Nothing, we feel powerless. And so Allah says, don't you ever imagine that those who disbelieve got ahead. And by the way, the disbelievers in Mecca, they had two strategies. And I want you to understand both of those strategies. One was a military strategy. I told you a little bit about that already. There's no discrimination, kill everyone. That was one. Allah prepared the believers to deal with that kind of enemy. He prepared them to deal with that kind of enemy. But there was another strategy. And the other strategy was to make sure that everybody in the region of Hijaz, the Arabian region, everybody believes that the Prophet ﷺ is a threat. He's a threat. He's dangerous. He will destroy families. He's no good. He doesn't belong. He's not really, he, you, you can't cooperate with him. Spreading rumors about him and spreading a, a reputation about him, creating propaganda against him, was part of the machinery of the Meccans. The first warfare is actually information warfare. Before you pick up a gun, the first kind of warfare is actually information warfare. 
And the Quran in Mecca, this is Madani Quran, but in Mecca Quran, Allah actually acknowledges on multiple occasions the information warfare that the Quraysh leaders were doing. Spreading, by the way, just he's a poet. We know, where, we know which poet teaches him. We know his shaykh. Come up with some story, spread it. You know, we found out that he's actually insane. Verified. We have the documents to prove it. Come up with some fake documents. Spread it. Let the world think. Let as many people as possible think that he's insane. Let as many people think this lie or that lie or another lie about him. And the Quran, instead of doing an investigative report on each of those allegations, you know what he, the Quran just says? Yeah, you're not insane. You're not a liar. Let's move on. Let's move on. In other words, the Quran didn't allow the Muslims to get distracted by the propaganda and make us feel the need to respond to each attack. Just Allah says, hey, you didn't do that. That's not you. That's not you. You know. Let's move on. You're not by the blessing of Allah, you're not a mind reader, you're not a sorcerer, and you're not insane. That's it. We can move on. You know, and, and by the way, just because we're not going to respond doesn't mean that the propaganda that is made, the lies that are spread against the believer, they don't hurt. They hurt even the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ Allah says, Allah tells about the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who's going to question the iman of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allah says, because of what they say, we know that your chest hurts. Their words cause you pain. You're going to hear a lot of painful words coming from those who were given the book before you. And those who commit shirk. you're going to hear many painful things. You're going to hear horrible, terrible, ugly allegations. This is what Allah, by the way, that ayah that I just cited for you, that was from Ali Imran after the battle of Uhud. But I need to focus and come back to what happens after Badr. He says, don't you think that they got away? They're not going to overpower. They are not going to make you ajiz. Ajiz means powerless. Yu'jiz is someone who makes someone else powerless. Understand the Arabic of this. If there's two people wrestling, or like UFC fights some of you guys like to watch, if one guy taps, the other guy taps out, he became mu'jaz. He became ajiz. The other one is mu'jiz. He, surrender, he made him surrender. He made him give in. I want you to move forward. There's a lot of people standing in the back. If you have space in front of you, take it. Innahum la yu'jizun. They are not going to cause you to surrender. They are not going to render you powerless. The feeling, the frustration that the believer is powerless is a lie. That's a lie we cannot afford to believe. The believer in this book, the believer in Allah's Quran is telling the Muslims already, doesn't matter how much more overwhelming their forces are, what other attack they will come with, let me give you one thing. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَبَقُوا Don't let them think. They should never think that they got ahead. That they, have, they got away with it. And they will not be overpowering. They won't be over, overpowering Allah and not even you. But then in the next ayah, which was actually supposed to be my primary focus today, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ Get ready for them. Prepare for them. Get ready for them. Allah could have just told us, Allah is enough for them. Like Allah says in another place in the Quran, Kafallahu al-Mu'minin al-Qital. Allah is enough to fight against the for the believers. Allah is enough as your support. And we all know what happened at Badr. The angels came before we even came. The angels struck before we even struck. Allah is enough. But then Allah at the same time tells the Muslims, now prepare. Prepare for them. How does a how does a team prepare for a match? They study their enemy, isn't it? If you're going to play a certain team in a football match, if you're going to play a certain team in a rugby match, I am in Australia, I got to reference rugby. If you're going to, these athletes that are fighting for the UFC championship, do they not study their opponent? Do they not study their strengths, their weaknesses? Don't they analyze what's their strategies? 
Because if you're going to engage in a fight and prepare, it doesn't just mean I'm going to prepare on my own. I'm going to study my enemy. I'm going to watch the footage. I'm going to understand how they play their game. I'm going to understand how they get away with it because I need to play them. I need to beat them at their game. That's my opponent. When Allah says, A'iddu lahum, the lahum is really important. He didn't just say, A'iddu, prepare. Prepare would mean, hey, let's, let's start exercising, let's start gathering, let's empower ourselves, and we don't, have, we don't care about what they do, Allah will take care of it. No, Allah says, A'iddu lahum. Understand your enemy. Study your enemy. Learn their strategies. How do they play the media? What financial games do they play? What political games do they play? What's going on behind the scenes? If you don't understand that, you're not understanding this ayah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood the Quraysh and he understood who are the Quraysh's trade partners. Who are their alliances with? Where do they go and make their money? How do they build their social network? Who is in affiliation with them? He understood the enemy. And then Allah says even something more profound. He says, مستطعتم, مستطعتم I was reading Ibn Ashur rahimahullah, on uh, this ayah. He said something really beautiful about Mastata'atum. He said, this is a tawassur. Let me translate it in English first. He says, prepare for them whatever you can. Whatever you're able to prepare. Allah could have been very specific. Allah could have said, prepare swords. Prepare... You know, pre prepare archers, prepare spears, prepare battle training, prepare ships. He didn't say any of that. He said, whatever you can. You know what that means? That means that this is not referring to one battlefield or one strategy. There are multiple battlefields. Like I said, there was a military war, but there was also an information war, wasn't it? And some of you are going to be very good. Your preparation will be gathering intelligence. Somebody else's preparation will be understanding this, the economic strategy. Somebody else's preparation will be understanding the military strategy. There are different people that are poised and specialized in understanding different components of the enemy. And you will all have to get involved. This is a command for the collective. مستطعتم. Allah gave each one of us a different kind of strength, a different kind of ability. And he wants to, the, the Muslims were being told at the time, you now need to understand that this preparation is not one kind of preparation, it's multifaceted. You should not think of it in one direction, one way. You have to think of it in multiple ways. And then he says, min quwwatin, which is one of my most, most incredible phrases in the Quran. Prepare whatever you can. Min, this is called min at tanawwur in Arabic. Any kind of power you can. Prepare for them. Whatever you can, gathering and collecting any kind of power at all. Allah didn't say Al-Quwa Billam al Ta'rif. This is a tankir. Arabic students will hear, here will know. And min is not just bayaniya, it's also min at which means any kind of power. So the thing now, what I want to leave you with, I want you I want you to really give thought to this. The world functions on power. Whether it's in the world of science, your car, your vehicle needs power to run. Your houses need electrical power to function. Right? Trains and airplanes and all of the devices we have need battery power or some kind of power. But society itself functions on power. Your boss has certain power. The police officer down the street has certain power. The government has certain power. People in a family, if you're the head of the household, you have a certain amount of power. The Qur'an in this ayah is giving us something incredible. It's telling us to understand power is not one thing. Power is multiple things. And you have to understand that power is changing all the time. It's not one definition. And Allah then says to the Muslims of that time, وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ Gather whatever power you can, especially you need to gather the ability to charge with horses. So he mentions horses second. This is mina, uh, you know, this is al iltifat min al amil al khas. He went from the open, all kinds of power, but especially horses. Why especially horses? Because at Badr we had very few horses. 
And Allah is letting us know, listen, the more horses you have, something will happen. The enemy sees that you are gathering more horses, it's going to scare them. تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ It's going to be a deterrent for you. But Allah is teaching us, Allah could have just said, just prepare horses. He said, no, all kinds of power. So what I want you to leave, the thought I want to leave with you is as follows. I live in the United States. And in the United States, you would think the highest position of power is the presidency, you would think. You know, the, 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 the Pharaoh's palace, the White House, that's the seat of power. That's where the, you know, the, the, the commander-in-chief of the military, the United States military sits with the red button. That's where the executive chief executor sits. He can give executive orders, etc. But if you know anything about politics, especially about American politics, you would know that presidents are not much more than puppets. Presidents can come and go. But presidents, they'll give a public speech or a shake hands and do a press release. But when that press release is over, they're going to go meet with CEOs and boards of conglomerates and weapons manufacturers and the oil industry and the media industries and all of those multi-billion, trillion dollar corporations that will sign the checks for their next campaign or let them know, hey, this is what you need to push and this is what you don't need to push. You, you would think it looks like the president is in power, but behind him is an entire economic engine. And that's actually in power. And if he messes with that economic engine, he's done with. He's done with. And this is a reality, I think everybody, nobody's naive here, everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. There used to be a time where you would think, Muslims would think, power means military, power means weapons, power means planes, tanks, nuclear bombs, this is what power means. But actually, those, even those militaries are militaries for hire. Behind them is another kind of power. Behind them is an economic power. Behind them is a media power. Behind them is technological power. The definition of power changed. The definition of power in the world has changed. Presidents come and go, corporations stay. Wars come and go, and one party wins and the other party wins, but the corporation keeps making more and more money. Even in this current conflict, you, I, you can easily imagine that weapons manufacturers all over the West, Europe and the United States, their, their, their stocks are skyrocketing right now. They're skyrocketing right now. Who profits from this? Who gains more power? And the more power they gain, the more influence they gain. When Muslims don't understand their enemy, أَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ Because the enemy puts somebody in front of you that you think this is the real enemy. But behind them, there's an entire mechanism. If you don't understand that mechanism, you've prepared nothing. You've prepared nothing. We need to now, it's time that Muslims need to put their best foot forward. These crises, we all know, some of you are my age, some of you are older than I am, some of you are younger than I am, even the ones that are older than I am. We have seen not one, but multiple disasters of the ummah, every year, every other year. Some people here sitting here remember what happened in Bosnia. Some people sitting here remember what was going on in Kosovo. What was happening in, in India. Some people, these tragedies of the ummah, the bloodshed, the mass bloodshed of the ummah, and every time that happens, what do we say? We have to raise our voice. We have to raise our voice. We have to raise our voice. We've been saying this for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. Raise your voice, raise your voice. The guy was 18 years old. He's 58 years old now. He's still raising his voice. But something doesn't change. And then we say, no, Allah is not answering our du'as. We need to do something more drastic. Maybe we don't understand what Allah told us all along. You, need, you want to be able to be heard? You want to be able to be heard without even raising your voice? Learn to gather power. The, old, the, the, the enemy of, of Allah doesn't fear your voice. You know what they fear though? When you start amassing power. When you become powerful. There are nations in the world, I'll end with this, there are nations in the world today that have a military, but they don't intend on invading other nations. They have no interest in invading other nations. But they have a lot of interest in doing business with other nations. So they're opening up, they're buying ports, and they're making investments all over the world. 
And those same nations, after they make all these investments, sometimes they are oppressing their own population. Their own. And you know what? Nobody will say anything. Not because we're afraid of their military. Because if anybody raises their voice and says, hey, you can't do that to those people, they'll say, okay, we'll just pull out our investments from your country and let your entire currency tank and let your real estate market crash and let your, let your stock market crash. Let's see how you deal with that. So everybody just quietly lets them do whatever they want to do. You know why? Because they didn't need a military or fighter jets or weapons to have power. They, just, they used economic power as their engine, didn't they? And, and with that power, they don't have to even open their mouth. They don't have to say anything and they're heard around the world anyway. Muslims, it is time us collectively, we start thinking about that. We start thinking about what does it mean to be powerful in, and strategic in dealing with propaganda? What does it mean to become powerful and strategic in dealing with the economic engines that run this world? And how do we combat that together as an ummah? We are the, the most pre precious human resource. Is the precious resource is actually the human resource. And we are a massive population of the world. The Muslims are the most powerful population on earth without realizing it. Absolutely without realizing it. If we don't understand these lessons and we, if we want to see change come overnight, for dreaming of change just coming. When is the change coming? When is the help of Allah coming? Wait, hold on. This is not how it comes. Allah has given a formula in His book. He gave us a formula. If you don't want to follow that formula, then the problem is not with the deen, and the problem is not, it's problems with you. Rasulullah would teach us that even in the middle of the greatest fitna, if you are planting a tree, keep planting the tree. Why? Because planting a tree is not a short-term strategy, it is a long-term strategy. And power does not come. If you get power quickly, you will lose power quickly. But you have to build power if you want it to be sustainable. You have to build that power, especially the young people that are here. I actually want you to not only engage seriously in the study of Allah's book, but I want you to seriously start thinking about what power means. Allah wants us to explore the meaning of this word. Because Allah wants to gather, make us gather it. And He wants to make us gather it after observing our enemy. May Allah make us realize how powerful we truly are. And may Allah help us as an ummah to live up to the mandate of this ayah of becoming a truly powerful ummah that doesn't have to yell and scream for its voice to be heard, its very existence creates fear in those who would want to kill innocents. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa thikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lati nastafa khususan ala afdalihi al-bukhatam al-nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Qal Allahu azza wa jal fi kitabihi al-kareem ba'da an aqula a'udhu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا الله Give you a few seconds to just get as close as possible, make as much room as possible. For people in the back, استقيموا يا رحمكم الله. الله أكبر.
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد ونعبدين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله فآمن الطائفة من بني إسرائيل وكفر الطائفة فأيدنا الذين آمنوا على عدوهم فأصبحوا ظاهرين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله